is Whitley Strieber, and you're listening to My Alien Life. But most, you know, but most of the people there were farmers, including the man who perpetrated the massacre, whose name was Andrew Kehoe, uh, who was a very well-respected member of the community. Uh, in fact, he had held several town offices, and he uh, actually had gotten himself elected um, school board treasurer. They had all this like leftover explosives, all this leftover TNT. So um, they uh, made it into what was called pyrotol. Pyrotol, which looked just like sticks of dynamite, but they were low-grade dynamite. And they were the government was selling it to farmers so that they could clear their property of tree stumps and boulders. And each farmer was allowed to buy a thousand pounds of it. So yeah, so Kehoe you know, very easily and legally acquired, I think about 500 pounds of pyrotol. He also bought some additional dynamite from some local hardware stores. You know, he put together uh, some simple timers. My Alien Life is recorded high atop the Northern Rocky Mountains and is heard all over the world. And you can listen everywhere. Fine podcasts are found. My website is www.myalienlifepodcast.com. There you'll find links to every episode, stories, photos, and much more. I'm your host, Cam Logan. This is My Alien Life, and the podcast starts right now. My Alien Life Podcast. In 1927, while the majority of the township of Bath, Michigan was celebrating a new primary school, Andrew Kehoe had other plans. The aftermath was the deadliest school massacre in U.S. history. Tonight, I talk about that with Dr. Harold Schechter. That and more is coming right up on My Alien Life. You ask 100 people on the street where was the deadliest school massacre in U.S. history, and maybe you have asked this question. What would they say, sir? Well, I mean, most people would probably say Sandy Hook um, or Virginia Tech, I guess. Uh, I think that uh, school shooting claimed over 30 lives, Um, but they would be mistaken. Uh, because a hundred years ago, almost in 1927, uh, the worst school massacre in U.S. history occurred. And uh, what's very interesting about it to me, uh, one of the reasons I wrote my book Maniac, is precisely how thoroughly it's been forgotten. And you're a you're a prolific writer, so for some reason this grabbed your attention. Do you remember when the first time you heard about this was, and and why it? grabbed your attention enough to uh, provoke a, a, a book? Um, yeah, I do, actually. Years ago, uh, I wrote a book called Psycho USA, Famous American Killers You Never Heard Of. Um, and the impetus behind that was, uh, you know, I become, wasn't actually something I set out to become, <laughs> um, but I have become a historian of American crime. And, uh, you know, I've been kind of fascinated by the way certain crimes um, have entered into our cultural mythology. You know, there are these in the 20th century, there are all these crimes of the century. 
uh, going back, well, at least to the 1920s with Leopold and Loeb, the college-age thrill killers, um, and then the Lindbergh baby kidnapping and uh, the Manson horrors and all the way up to OJ. Uh, but then there are all these other crimes that I would come across in my researches, which were equally and sometimes much more awful and heinous. Uh, and some of those crimes did generate a lot of media attention briefly, and then again, completely faded into obscurity. So uh, actually the Bath, what is called the Bath School Disaster, which is the subject of my book, Maniac, um, was one of those cases that I wrote an entry about uh, in my book, Psycho USA. And, uh, you know, but then I, 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 thinking about it and doing more research into the case, you know, I thought it was worth expanding into an entire book, partly because I had become convinced that it was really the single worst uh, American crime of the 20th century. And, and it was uh, fascinating to me, intriguing to me, somewhat puzzling to me, why it had been so thoroughly forgotten. And why was it? I mean, there obviously, it probably didn't make news then like it did now. But, you know, for example... Um, I'm 55 years old. My grandparents uh, grew up near Minneapolis, and and they remember every crime and talk mm-hmm. about it, you know, until the day they died. And um, mm-hmm. so, did this one get forgotten? I mean, obviously, there are people who remember it. Yeah, there are some people locally, but you know, I've spoken to a lot of people from Michigan who grew up there and never heard of it. Um, uh, you know, there are various reasons I think it's been forgotten. I mean, one was. Um, well, going back to what you're saying a moment ago, I mean, obviously they didn't have 24-7 cable news coverage, but it was a nationwide media sensation. In fact, it was an international media sensation. Um, Adolf Hitler wrote a, a condolence letter to FDR, um, you know, because it, it, it generated headlines in Germany back then. Uh, that was sweet. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly <laughs> who you want to. Yeah. That's who you want to get a letter of condolence exactly. from. <laughs> um, but, um, but, but again, I mean, you know, people then read newspapers and this did make the front pages of newspapers across the country. Um, but, uh, one thing that happened was that two days, um, after it occurred, uh, Charles Lindbergh made his world changing solo flight across the Atlantic from New York to right. Paris, you know, which was uh, an event back then as momentous as the moon landing was four decades later. And that pretty much displaced like every other news story from the front pages. In fact, the New York Times, the day after um, the Bath School massacre, made it was the made it the, the lead story on its front page. Um, and then three days later, after Lindbergh's flight, the first entire five pages of the New York Times uh, were devoted to stories about Lindbergh. And again, the Bath School disaster completely disappeared from the news. I mean, it was still obviously a big story locally in Michigan at that time. But but I think another reason that it um, didn't resonate so much for people back then, it, you know, I, I've come to believe that the crimes... Um, that, uh, that that come to obsess people at a particular moment are ones that somehow reflect or symbolize or embody certain kinds of widespread anxieties and fears that the public has at the moment. So that, for example, going back to Leopold and Loeb, uh, the two college-age thrill killers of the 1920s, you know, back then people were really, really worried about, you know, college kids gone wild was the Roaring Twenties. They called them the Flaming Youth. And somehow Leopold and Loeb came to symbolize that fear, just as, you know, Manson symbolized every middle American's fear of sex and drug-crazed hippiedom back then. So, you know, the best school disaster, um, this this uh, school massacre and, and act of domestic terrorism, it, it just seems so... 
anomalous at the time. It, you know, it, it just seemed like a very, very freakish kind of crime that didn't resonate with the anxieties of the people at the time. You know, in my book, I describe it as a horror ahead of its time. Um, obviously, God forbid, if something like that happened today, you know, it would be a huge, huge story. Um, but back then, people pretty quickly forgot it. You know, they were focused on other kinds of crimes at that time. And obviously, there wasn't a lot of precedence in that type of crime, too. So possibly they yeah. thought this was a, a one-time deal and, and hopefully it would go away. Yeah, exactly. I mean, at the same, I cover this in my book, at the exact same time uh, that the Bath School disaster happened, um, uh, the country was obsessed with the case of what came to be called the Dublin Indemnity Murder, uh, this uh, Queen's housewife named Ruth Snyder, who conspired with her mousy lover boy to murder her husband. Uh, and, um, you know, that became one of the huge, again, crimes of the century. But, but the public was absolutely fixated on that crime. Uh, again, it became the inspiration for the novel and then the movie Double Indemnity. And uh, again, the reason... I think was that um, Ruth Snyder symbolized in the minds of the public, you know, many things that people were very, very anxious and fearful of. You know, they thought of her as this flapper. You know, uh, you know, people again were in, in, at that point in the twenties, the jazz age. You know, very worried about the breakdown of traditional morality, and Ruth Snyder, this adulterous woman scheming to murder her husband with her lover, seemed to represent, you know, all the things about American, you know, American culture going to hell in a handbasket. So, you know, that one murder of uh, Snyder's husband came to dominate the news, whereas the Bass School massacre. Um, you know, which not, where 38 children and six adults got killed, you know, is almost immediately forgotten. So back in the 1920s, Bath, Michigan, what, what kind of town was it? Um, how big was it? Who lived there? What did they do? Well, it was a small farming community um, located maybe like a 20 minute drive from Lansing. Uh, I mean, there, there's a, it was a town, and of course there were merchants in the town and uh, blacksmiths and so on and so forth. I mean, the usual kinds of uh, uh, stores um, that would service a community, churches, etc. But, mo- you know, but most of the people there uh, were farmers, including the man who perpetrated the massacre, whose name was Andrew Kehoe, uh, who was a, a very well-respected member of the community. Uh, in fe- he had held several town offices, and he uh, actually had gotten himself elected um, school board treasurer. Uh, You know, the background to the massacre had to do with this movement uh, that um, existed back then in rural communities throughout the country, uh, having to do with the educational system of these small rural and farming communities. Uh, There was this movement to do away with the old one-room schoolhouses, and to build these modern, what they called consolidated schools, where all the kids would come and be educated from elementary up through high school. Uh, You know, there was a feeling that the kids in these rural communities were at an educational disadvantage. They weren't receiving the kind of educations that their big city counterparts were, uh, again, in these little one-room schoolhouses. So there was this movement to build these schools, there was some. There was always some opposition uh, to them in the community because, uh, you know, they were expensive to build, and uh, you know, it meant people's taxes were going to be raised. And, and some people, you know, a lot of the farmers felt that they had received perfectly fine educations in these little red schoolhouses, uh, and anyway, their kids were just going to be farmers or farm wives. So why did they need fancy educations? Uh, and that was the debate that went on in Bath. But finally. Uh, the community voted to build this consolidated school. Uh, and Andrew Kehoe um, was opposed to the construction of the school. Um, again, he didn't like the idea of having his property taxes raised to pay for it, particularly since he had no kids. But once it was built, he got himself 
elected to the school board as treasurer um, because he felt he could at least keep an eye on the uh, expenditures. So, so that was the context of the bath school disaster. Well, I think too, even now that a lot of people join the school board just because they have a grievance or a problem with the mm-hmm. school or, you know, they have a problem, their kids have problems with school. So, I mean, even back then it, it, it mirrors kind of what happens today. And, and, you know, I grew up on the Montana high line, which was all consolidated schools and, you know, and that was happening. And so interestingly enough, um, that went on for a very, very long time. But, um, Mm -hmm. so what, what, what other foothold did he have in the community? I mean, was he well known or, or notorious? Yes. No, no, he wasn't notorious. I mean, you know, he was, um, uh, he had his eccentricities. Uh, for example, um, he would go out and do his farming chores dressed pretty much as a banker. He always wore, uh, a, you know, a three piece suit when he was riding around in his tractor and so on and so forth. Um, he was kind of compulsively neat, uh, in terms of uh, putting away his tools all the time, uh, you know, so, so people, he, he, he he had a, a very controlling uh, aspect to his personality. When he and his wife would play cards with neighbors, uh, he would get very upset if somebody didn't exactly play by the rules or if somebody made a mistake. Um, so, again, they noticed certain things like that. Um, there were also some hints that he possessed a streak of cruelty. Uh, evidently one time a neighbor's dog wandered onto his property and started digging bones and he killed the dog (laughs) evidently. Um, and apparently he once beat a horse to death, but, um, apart from those things, which, you know, did disturb the neighbors a bit, he was regarded as, you know, a very neighborly person. He had a, a lot of mechanical skill and an engineering background, and he was always ready to help a neighbor uh, repair some kind of farm apparatus or whatever. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, he was regarded as pretty much a pillar of the community. So he killed this dog. Was it a brutal killing? Was Was there anything remarkable about it, or was it just something that just happened? I mean, I think he beat it to death. I mean, yeah. I mean, That's it significant, was, uh, yeah. Yeah. And also the horse. I mean, uh, the horse was being recalcitrant or something. And, and uh, you know, the neighbor saw him beating it. And the neighbor came back like the next day and discovered that he had beaten this horse to death. So he definitely, you know, had a sadistic streak to him. Um, and, uh, you know, I think in both instances, it was also a manifestation of his need to be kind of pathologically controlling um, and, uh, you know, have everything exactly the way he needed it to be in his little world. So when, you know, the dog was digging up his yard, you know, he just killed it. And when the horse, you know, refused to perform that day, you know, he beat it to death. So. So there were there were definitely there were definitely some some red flags there, but I mean nothing nothing significant enough to really uh, you know raise any major alarms in his neighbors. Although it's got to take quite a while to beat a horse to death, you think that would have um, raised a few eyebrows? Uh, yeah. Well, I don't know how many people. Apparently, only this one neighbor. Um, was witness to the thing. I, I don't think the neighbor actually saw him beat the horse to death. I think the neighbor saw him kind of whipping the horse, and then the next day uh, the horse was being carted off, you know, to the glue factory or whatever. Uh, and and uh, and Kehoe explained, you know, that you know that he'd ended up killing it. Did the people, different people around the uh, community describe him differently? I mean, were there people that were, were, were fond of him and then there are other people who saw dark side? Well, there was definitely, again, uh, you know, nobody saw or could have guessed at, you know, the depths of paranoia 
and uh, he, you know, and ultimately kind of homicidal mania that he uh, descended into. Um, you know, but there were definitely people who saw a, a very, very harsh side to his personality, particularly the superintendent of the consolidated school, who was a young man named Henry Hoyk, uh, who was very, very committed to the school and very instrumental in getting the school to uh, achieve its academic accreditation and, you know, really devoted himself to the school. And he and Kehoe uh, ended up in loggerheads. I mean, they really became, I mean, uh, Hoyk became kind of bet noir for you know, for uh, for Kehoe, you know, because Kehoe saw him as a rival to his own uh, power uh, over the school. And uh, so, you know, people did witness, um, you know, the antagonism uh, between them, I mean, which was mostly coming from Kehoe. Did he mostly, when he was farming, um, was that, a sole proprietorship? Did he have anybody that worked for him? Did he spend time with other people? Did he have, um, you know, uh, extended family members who were with him on and off or, or helped him with the farm? Uh, I don't believe he did have other people helping his, uh, in his farm. He seemed to be farming all by himself. He was married. Uh, he and his wife both got married uh, kind of late in life. Um, and uh, she had... Uh, she had local family, um, sisters and an uncle and so on and so forth. They didn't live in Bath, but they lived nearby. Uh, his fa- he, I mean, he had come from a fairly large uh, Irish family, um, but by the time he was settled in Bath, uh, his parents were gone. Uh, his sis- Two of his sisters became nuns. They were in convents. And uh, another sister had become uh, one of the first women lawyers, uh, but so she was living, I can't remember now if she was in Lansing, but anyway, she wasn't in the immediate vicinity. So whatever family he had um, was his wife's family. And how was his relationship? Any, any research did you find out about a relationship with his wife and how that was? Yeah, there wasn't a lot about that. Um, you know, whatever testimony there was, you know, they seemed, they did do a certain amount of socializing. They liked to play whist uh, with other people. Uh, yeah, I mean, there were no indications that there was anything seriously amiss in their marriage. She began to suffer some serious health issues uh, and had to be repeatedly hospitalized. And he seemed, you know, he seemed devoted to her, uh, although at the same time uh, increasingly under stress, uh, both emotionally and financially. Uh, You know, one thing that happened was he he began to suffer, um, you know, fairly serious financial difficulties. I mean, one of the things I discovered in my research, which I hadn't known, one of the reasons I like to do these books is because I'm always finding stuff out that I didn't know, um, is that uh, for a lot of American farmers, the Great Depression really started in the 20s uh, because um, they had they had flourished during World War I uh, you know, because in what, you know, nobody was growing crops in Western Europe. So American farmers were shipping over all these crops and, uh, their livelihoods were booming and many of them, you know, invested in new farm machinery and bought additional land. Uh, you know, they would take out loans, but then once the war was over and, uh, Western Europe, you know, was returning to normality, uh, and growing its own crops again, uh, you know, uh, uh, prices plunged um, for the agricultural products that the American farmers were, were you know, growing. And, uh, and again, Kehoe was one of those people uh, whose finances really took a, a very, very precipitous slide. Um, so by 1927, he was in deep financial trouble. He couldn't even pay his mortgage and he was deeply in debt. 
and his wife was, you know, in, in ill health and there were huge hospital bills to pay for. So his life was really unraveling by the spring of 1927. One of the thoughts I had, and, and I still am wondering, um, yeah, he had, he had some financial hardship, but at one time, wasn't he an electrician? I was wondering why he didn't fall back on that. Well, I mean, he was an electrician. I'm not sure exactly, you know, how much need there was for an electrician in Bath in 1927. Right, in that part of the world, yeah. Yeah. So, I mean, he did actually, um, he, he was uh, made, although I think it was probably an unpaid position, but he was a kind of uh, unofficial handyman for the school. Um, so you know, which gave him 24 seven access to the school. But yeah, I don't know how much, uh, you know, money an electrician would have made in Beth, Michigan in those days. When you were looking into this and I know there was a, an account where he may have killed his sister's cat and he possibly murdered his, his stepmother or was she murdered? What did she die in that, that uh, stove incident or yeah. she did? Well, yeah. Yes, she did die. I mean, uh, he he was never totally accused of, well, he was actually, there was some suggestion he'd rig this. I mean, what happened was uh, that, um, uh, again, something else I didn't know, uh, back then, these gasoline-fueled stoves, kitchen stoves, um, were being advertised as this, you know, modern appliance that was you know, it would save housewives all this work. They don't have to get up at five o'clock in the morning and, you know, light, you know, a, a wood fire in their wood stove and so on and so forth. Um, and, and the way they operated was there'd be stoves, there'd be a little tank with gasoline above the stove uh, that would feed the stove. Um, and of course, they were incredibly hazardous, as it turned out. Right. Uh, the papers are just filled with stories of people, you know, suffering horrible accidents when those things exploded. And apparently that happened with his stepmother. And, you know, suppose, it, you know, suppose there, are, there are these different stories that emerge later. Uh, one that he came in while she was in flames and he just stood there and watched her burn. Another that maybe he had rigged it. But, you know, those stories are very, very, very questionable. They're all told uh, in, 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 in light of, you know, the atrocity he did per- commit later on. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, in my, in my researches into other books, I'm always come across cases where, you know, somebody commits a horrible crime and then, you know, things in their past, some family member who's close to them, who's died under somewhat mysterious circumstances, you know, they get blamed for murdering them. And usually those things are not, not the case. You know, I, I feel fairly confident that that uh, you know that Kehoe did not commit murder until you know he perpetrated the Bath School massacre. So, what was the tipping point? Um, he sort of had a normal life with a few exceptions, and then he basically went over the edge somehow. Well, you know, he fits the profile, the classic profile of a mass murderer. Um, you know, somebody whose life has, you know, come unraveled and, you know, feels everything has come to an end and uh, is, ba- you know, mass murder, as I'm sure you probably know, is a suicidal act. Um, uh, you know, this person is going to end his own life, but he's going to take as many other people with him as he can in this act of apocalyptic violence. Uh, he's going to take revenge on the world. He's going to take revenge on the people, you know, often that he blames uh, for why his life has reached this pass. Uh, Kehoe, <coughs> excuse me, um, you know, is classic, what psychologists call malignant narcissist. Uh, everything was about him. And when he wasn't getting his way, when he wasn't elected to these town offices after a while, uh, when his farm failed, he blamed everybody. Um, and, uh, you know, the humiliation was just too much for him. Uh, and uh, he was also what criminologists call an injustice collector. You know, they seethe and brood over, you know, these slights and insults and things that they, you know, that they feel other people have, 
directed at them and, and, and ended up ruining their lives. So, yeah, I mean, that seems to have been, you know, it was a combination, again, of his financial failures, of, uh, you know, the insult, the insult to his very inflated sense of self-importance uh, that was he felt was inflicted on him when his townspeople didn't elect him to these towns, town officers. Uh, you know, he, he felt, again, that somehow having to pay these increased taxes for the school uh, you know, had seriously contributed to his financial troubles, you know, all those things together. So he was going to end it. He was going to end the world. He was going to end his world. And he was going to wreak this hideous revenge on his townspeople. So a crime like this is obviously premeditated because he would have had to collect explosives um, and whatever else to to set these events in motion. So how did that play out? Well, at the time, uh, the government, you know, there's all this uh, surplus uh, explosive that uh, the U.S. government had uh, had ordered from the DuPont company pretty much uh, entirely, uh, you know, to, to to manufacture armaments for, for the First World War. And with the armistice, uh, they had all this, like, leftover explosive, all this leftover TNT. So um, they uh, made it into what was called pyrotol. Pyrotol, which will just like sticks of dynamite, but they were low grade dynamite. And they were, the government was selling it to farmers so that they could clear their property of tree stumps and boulders. And each farmer was allowed to buy, I think a thousand pounds of it. I don't actually remember. Um, so yeah, so Kehoe, you know, very easily and legally acquired, I think about 500 pounds of pyrotol. He also bought some additional dynamite from some local hardware stores uh, again, he was, you know, had this mechanical electric skill. So he, you know, he put together uh, some simple timers. And because he was a school board member and also this handyman for the school, uh, he had, as I said, 24-7 access to the school. And in the spring of 1927, he spent weeks sneaking into the school at night and rigging the basement of the school with hundreds of pounds of explosives and he set these timers to detonate on the last day of school which would may 18th 1927 when he felt that pretty much every kid in the community would be in the school um and that's what happened you know at about nine o'clock in the morning on may 18th uh the timer went off actually uh, fortunately, some of the explosive didn't detonate because of short circuit or faulty wiring. Nobody really knows. If if it all had gone off, he basically would have killed every kid in the community. You know, wiped out an entire generation of kids uh, in that in that community. Um, but he still did destroy an entire wing of the school and uh, killed 38 children and a number of adults. Then, uh, while all these frantic parents and other people were rushed to the scene and were, you know, frantically trying to dig out you know, the kids, um, Kehoe loaded his Ford uh, with shrapnel and more dynamite, drove it to the scene of the explosion, called over Emily Hoyk, Emery Hoyk, excuse me, uh, the superintendent, some other people. Um, who were there, you know, trying to help to get the kids and blew up his car and blew himself up and blew Emery Hoyk and a few other people up. So, you know, the Bass School disaster was the worst school massacre in U.S. history. It was the worst act of domestic terrorism before Timothy McVeigh blew up the federal building in Oklahoma City. And it was the first and as far as I know, only suicide car bombing in our history. I mean, I'm discounting a little the recent Nashville bombing, right. um, you know, because, you know, it didn't claim any lives except the life of the guy who set it off. So it was all these, you know, horrors rolled into one. But again, they were kind of horrors that in a weird kind of way, didn't mean a lot to the people of the 1920s. I mean, again, they just seemed such a freakish one-off thing. They had to know what to make of it. 
um, it, 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 you know, the, the, the crime stands as this kind of weird precursor, uh, you know, of the kind of horrors we now worry about, uh, you know, of our own age. But back a hundred years ago, again, it was just kind of written off as this one-off act of a, of a madman. Was he originally or, or immediately a suspect? When did he become a suspect? Oh, they knew it was immediately. I mean, people saw him drive down, you know, I mean, with a car and blow himself up. Right. And then when they went, and then when they went to the farm, what they found was, uh, well, even be at the same time, uh, the school blew up. He had set all the buildings on his own property, his house and all the outbuildings. Uh, he had blown them up and set them on fire. He'd also murdered his wife uh, and uh, and set her corpse on fire. He wired together the legs of his horses so that they would burn to death in the barn, even stripped bark from the base of these young trees he had planted so the trees would die. I mean, he was going to destroy the whole world. Wow. Um, yeah. Yeah, obviously he's... He was very successful, not as successful as he could have been, thankfully. But um, yeah. So, what did the investigation look like? I mean, was it a typical investigation of that time period, or did they, you know, who was called in other than the local authorities? Well, I mean, they did hold an inquest, uh, mostly to determine. I mean, they, you know, there's no question that Kehoe had done this, right? Um, and uh, obviously there was not going to be any trial or anything. You know, they did hold an inquest uh, to determine whether uh, to try to resolve the question of Kehoe's state of mind. Um, and uh, that was actually a, a document that was very useful to me in writing the book. Um, you know, I got hold of a copy from uh, the town office in Bath. Uh, you know, they took testimony from Kehoe's neighbors and from survivors who had been at the school at the time of the disaster and, um, you know, different people who had known Kehoe. Uh, you know, and again, it was basically to you know, just uncover the details. You know, there'd be one neighbor who would, you know, testify to how he had driven Kehoe uh, to purchase the Pyrotol. Uh, and, uh, you know, some other neighbors who knew that he was experimenting with these detonators. Although, again, you know, they didn't make much of it. You know, they knew he was always messing around with these different gizmos and so on and so forth. You know, they just thought he was concocting these timers somehow to use, you know, for the legitimate purpose Pyrotol was supposed to be used for. Um, so, yeah, I mean, you know, that was the only real investigation into it. Uh, the conclusion of which was that they felt Kehoe, in fact, um, was sane at the time he committed the crime. Did he document any of this? Did they find any writing or, or anything that um, would have gave, given anybody any answers? No, the only thing they found um, on his property was uh, a wooden uh, piece of board uh, on which he had stenciled uh, the words, criminals are made, not born, um, you know, which I interpret as this last malicious taunting of his neighbors, as if he were saying to them, you brought this on yourself. Uh, you know, but, you know, it was obviously, among other things, you know, a, a clear confession. I mean, that he knew he was committing this horrible criminal act. And it wasn't, I mean, it definitely wasn't random. We do see random of acts of, of violence now, of, especially, you know, where people, people just kind of lose it and, and take it out on, on complete strangers. But they weren't mm -hmm. exactly strangers. So what the, what did the aftermath of this look like to the town and and what did they do to recover or was it just a mess for a very long time well i mean obviously yeah i mean it it, it, it was a horrible 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 blow to the town i mean 
you know, I, I can't remember the exact population, but you know, it was a very, very small community. You know, everybody knew some, everybody either was somebody, you know, who had suffered this terrible loss or, you know, was close to somebody who suffered this terrible loss, you know, and they had these, you know, just one funeral after another. And even now, you know, I, I went to Bath to do some research there and in Lansing. And, you know, if you walk through the graveyard in Bath, you just see, you know, one little gravestone after another, you know, with the name of all these, you know, kids who died and obviously all on the same date. So, yeah, I mean, you know, 38 funerals and, well, more than 38. I mean, you know, that's that's just the kids and then, you know, the adults who were killed. So it left a lasting, lasting scar in the community. Um, it also turned it into this kind of ghoulish tourist attraction, which often happens with the sites of sensational crimes. Uh, and that was another thing that was, you know, very, very difficult for the townspeople to bear was this constant flood for a while of uh, morbid sightseers, you know, who came by to, uh, you know, view the, the remains of the school. Of course, there were people there, too, who kind of profited off of it. Even now, you can go on eBay and buy postcards of the Bath School disaster, which were made at the time. All right. So where do you start researching a crime that occurred almost a century prior? I mean, what, what was there, was there resources or, or I'm sorry, was there a lot of information at, at your disposal there? Was it tough to, tough to start out? Um, well, a lot of newspaper stuff, um, you know, newspaper research now is somewhat easier than it was when I first started writing these books, which is like 30 years ago. Um, you know, back in those days, I had to spend months in the library, Xeroxing microfilms, uh, old microfilm copies of newspapers. I still have to do that because not every newspaper is digitalized. Um, but still, the newspaper research is easier. But yeah, um, you know, when I write these books uh, before I start actually writing them, uh, you know, I, I, I have to collect as much primary source material as I possibly can. Um, again, part of that involves going to Michigan and doing research in the Historical Society in Lansing and visiting Bath um, and, uh, uh, you know, getting whatever material I can. As I said, the, the transcript of the inquest was very, very useful to me. Uh, other books that I've written, trial transcripts are, you know, very, very important, but obviously there was no trial here. So, um, yeah, you know, just digging up as much information as I possibly can. You know, I look at secondary sources that there have been a couple of other books written about the Bath School disaster. You know, those are useful, sometimes useful because, you know, they lead me to other uh, 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 research materials. Um, so, yeah. Um, but in the end, you know, I managed to collect quite a bit of information on the case. What was the next um, school massacre that, that followed that? Do you even have any idea? I mean, of, of sig- Yeah. Well, probably, um, I guess, you know, it wasn't a school massacre like Columbine, right. but, you know, the next big mass murder, um, you know, was Charles Whitman, the Texas Tower Sniper, right. um, which happened, I think, in 66. Um, so yeah, that would have been, you know, that would have been the, you know, the nearest thing to it. And then after that, uh, you know, there were, you know, other, you know, there were mass murders. I mean, one of the first modern mass murders, although it didn't involve a school happened in Camden, New Jersey in 1949, where this, uh, army vet named Howard Unruh um, went on this killing spree in his town uh, with a German Luger and shot, I think, 13, you know, of his neighbors. Um, But in terms of school massacres, uh, there was the Texas Tower, (coughs) excuse me, sniper case, you know, then maybe, you know, nothing till it really made the news in a major way till Columbine. And of course, we see them more than ever, which is, I can't even describe if that's, it's, it's unusual for that, 
but you know, it surprises me every time. And, you know, and at this point in time, I actually have to, I was just telling somebody about this interview yesterday that, you know, I, I force myself to read these because, um, the, not just school massacres, but, but others, because it's, it's, you know, I don't want to forget and I don't want to become complacent and just think of this as, as another occurrence, but mm-hmm. it happens too much. I don't, I don't really know yeah. how to describe what's wrong with us now with so many people that it, it occurs more. I don't know if it's a population thing or if it's something totally different. What are your thoughts? Yeah, you know, it's hard to know why certain kinds of crimes um, become more prevalent at a certain time. You know, one of the interesting interesting things to me is that, you know, obviously, like in the 80s and 90s, you know, everybody's obsessed with serial killers. Um, and, 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 you know, even though, you know, there was a sense that like, like every every other person was a serial killer. Um, you know, there weren't, a, you know, still an infinitesimal uh, portion of the population, but still, I mean, you know, it was an age that produced John Wayne Gacy and Ted Bundy and Jeffrey Dahmer and, you know, the Hillside Stranglers and Son of Sam. You know, there was something about the social and cultural conditions of the time that gave rise you know, to this rash of, you know, terrifying serial murders, you know, th- I mean, I'm sure there, you know, we, there, there still are serial killers, but, you know, but, but that kind of crime seems to have diminished, you know, now it's the mass murderer. And again, exactly what particular conditions, you know, have given rise to this right now, you know, that's a, a very difficult question to ask. I mean, to answer. So, um, you know, there are mass murderers in other cultures. You know, periodically you read about some guy in Japan, you know, who has rampaged through a school with a knife or a sword. Uh, you know, there was a hideous, hideous mass murder in uh, Norway, I guess, a few years ago. I mean, I can't remember the number of victims. It was something like 70. Um you know, it's it's just hard to know what conditions uh, precipitate that stuff. I mean, obviously, you know, we just had one happen yesterday, the day before, right. in Atlanta. Um, you know, I don't know if it's the isolation of some people that allows them to, you know, brood over these things. And, you know, obviously, there's a lot of access to very, very deadly weapons. Um, you know, that makes some of these things, you know, these school massacres tend to be perpetrated, you know, with, uh, you know, sophisticated weaponry. Um, although, again, you know, there have been school massacres that have been perpetrated, like in Japan, with knives. Uh, so, yeah, it's just it's just hard to know. But it does seem to be the crime du jour. Um, you know, mass murder. Yes, it is. Has the town of Bath memorialized this massacre in some way? Can you see anything yeah. there that would describe yeah. that? Uh, there's a little park which has the, this is a word that I'm always embarrassed to, isn't it, that I'm not sure the pronunciation, but the cupola of right. the school, the original school, uh, still stands there as a memorial. And um, uh, the, the, after the school was destroyed, they, they built a new one. That one was torn down, I think, in the 70s. Um, now there's a, a very nice modern middle school, and uh, they have what they call a, a, a bath school disaster museum. You know, it's more like an elaborate display. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, Bath has certainly not forgotten this, and, and it is memorialized there. You have a bunch of interesting books. You, so... How many books to your credit? There's like at least almost 50, right? Uh, getting close to it, yeah. yeah. Um, well, you know, uh, not all of them are true crime, as right. you may or may not know, um, and some people don't. Uh, you know, for 42 years until my recent retirement, uh, my day job was a professor of American literature at uh, a, a, a branch of the City University of New York. So, you know, some of my writing was academic writing, 
um, you know, I, I've written books on a variety of subjects, though uh, about 30 years ago, I was led to write my first true crime book um, when I came across the fact. I was researching a book about movies, and I've always, you know, I'm a baby boomer. When I grew up in the 50s, you know, my world was surrounded by monster movies and, you know, creature feature shows on TV and horror comics. So, you know, horror stuff has always been a very, very central part of my imaginative life. And uh, I was researching a, a book on the movies and came across the fact that my two favorite horror movies, Psycho and Texas Chainsaw Massacre, had both been inspired by the same real life crime. Uh, the crimes of this uh, Midwestern farmer named Ed Gein in the 1950s. Uh, and, uh, you know, I researched that and wrote that book. And then one thing led to another. And again, before I knew it, I was a historian of uh, American crime, which again was not my career goal when I set out. I sort of pictured myself just, you know, writing academic articles on Nathaniel Hawthorne short stories. Um, but, uh, you know, this is how it's evolved. What do you like better, fiction or nonfiction? In terms of reading or writing? Writing. Uh, you know, both. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, they're both very satisfying to me. Um, Seems though that uh, it, nonfiction, like the, like your book Maniac, I mean, it's so labor intensive. I mean, it's there's a lot of lot that went on there before you actually get it on paper. Yeah, well, you know, uh, the no I wrote, for example, four novels from mystery novels uh, with Edgar Allan Poe as a protagonist, and those required a great deal of research. Um, and I love doing research. It's the reason I became an academic you know, and got a PhD. Right. Uh, so, you know, so the research in that sense isn't daunting to me. It's actually something I really, really enjoy. Um, and, you know, the writing is something that I, at this point, need to do. You know, people always say, oh, you're so disciplined. But what I tell them, it's, it's not discipline at this point. It's just a habit. Um, you know, I've been doing it so long. If I don't write for a certain amount of time every morning you know i get very anxious so you know again it's it's basically habitual to me at this point in my life and your wife's a writer too so basically that household is you know you you own your own library literally uh yeah got a lot of books <laughs> yeah <laughs> um yes my wife is uh you know, fairly well-known poet. She works at her writing much harder than I do. I mean, she really keeps bankers hours. She'll, uh, you know, have breakfast and then go sit in her study and, and I won't see her again. You know, I'll see her briefly for lunch and then, you know, not till around five o'clock. You know, I basically, I tell people I'm a human dynamo between like 8.30 a.m. and 11 a.m. Um, and after that, you know, just... Um, so you pound out... 10 pages in a couple hours and call it good or how does, how long do you spend at it and how, how far do you get? No, no, not 10 pages. Um, I'm a very slow writer. Right. Uh, you know, years ago, I remember Kurt Vonnegut saying there are two kinds of writers. Um, you know, one is somebody who will like, uh, my daughter is a writer and she's this kind of writer where she'll, you know, write like a 300 page draft and then, you know, fairly quickly and then go over it and over it and over it. I'm the second kind of writer, you know, which is I write very, very kind of laboriously. Uh, you know, I, until I get one paragraph right, I can't go on to the next paragraph. So, you know, if I, I produce... The other thing is I, I set very... <laughs> I set my expectations very low. I set a very low bar for myself. Um, so I'll say, oh, maybe I'll just write a paragraph today. You know, then I'll write two paragraphs and feel really good about myself. Um, so, but usually I set myself the task of writing one finished page a day. Uh, and I write every day. So the way it works is, and this is what I would tell my students, if you write one page a day for 365 days, you have a book. Right. Do you, so, um, do you, have, do you have people that you like to proofread? Um, or is that something that you do all on your own? I know some people have a whole list of people they like to read their stuff, but some people don't like that. Well, I leave the proofreading, you know, to my editors. Right. Um, you know, when I a book like, you know, a book like Maniac, you know, was read by my, you know, my editor read it, 
proofreader read it and then a fact checker read it and then somebody else read it um you know i'm not a great proofreader as i said i mean you know before i finish for the day i'll go over and over and over you know the page i've written um and you know make whatever corrections but but yeah i i, I don't i don't proofread the finished manuscript talk briefly if you would about uh, where people can find you on the internet because you do have a nice website uh well haroldschechter.com and i do have i'm not a social media person um but i do have a, a a facebook page which is maintained for me by somebody who you know then sends me any messages i receive on it um yeah so those are the two places and i don't did i find you on facebook do you have a facebook page i, I do remember. have a facebook page right. yeah Again, I mean, I, I never go on it, but if like you um, or anybody else contacts me, you know, which happens not infrequently, uh, I am immediately alerted to that. And then I get in contact with the person. How many books do you have available on Amazon right now? You know, I, I can't really answer that question, but I would say... I was trying to tally them up, but I couldn't. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's, um, there's books yeah. on Amazon by you, for sure. Yeah. yeah. Excellent. Uh, yes. Yeah. So the book is Maniac. Dr. Harold Schechter has been my guest. Dr. Harold Schechter, thank you so much. And if you want to look at his work, again, it's www.haroldschechter.com. And um, are you ever out in the public? Do you do any readings? Uh, yeah, um, absolutely. This is, this is mean, a new book. Obviously. Yeah, well, actually... Um, you know, given the age, you know, the moment we live in, um, I've been doing a lot of radio stuff and podcasting back in the day when, you know, you could actually go outside and, you know, talk in front of an audience. I would give readings, but I yeah. uh, haven't done that for a little while. So, so I appreciate your having me on. Absolutely. Glad to have you. And thank you so much, um, Dr. Harold Schechter. Have a good evening. Thank you. You too. Thanks. You can find my website at www.myalienlifepodcast.com and please subscribe to my latest downloads at iTunes, Spotify, Stitcher, and at podbean.com. And please follow me and like me on Facebook and Twitter. My Alien Life is written and produced for broadcast at Studio 254 in the Northern Rocky Mountains. The music you are hearing is produced and created by Elion. You can find all Elion's work online at Heart Dance Records. Oh, 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 oh,